Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to today's webinar, Agile Access to Drug Discovery Data with D360. I will now turn it over to Diana O'Rourke, Marketing Director at Sertara. Diana? Thanks, Nathan, and hello, everyone. Thanks again for attending today's webinar. Uh, as Nathan mentioned, the webinar will be recorded, and a link to a replay will be available on the Sertara website within the next few days. Additionally, we'll be emailing a link to you uh, just immediately post-event as soon as it becomes available. So you'll have that in the inbox should you wish to listen again or share with a friend. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dennis Powell. Currently, Dr. Powell is a senior consultant for Sertara, where he works with Sertara scientists to help pharmaceutical companies evaluate and improve their discovery research data mining environments. Most recently, Dr. Powell was a dis director of medicinal chemistry at Pfizer, formerly Wyeth, where he successfully managed chemistry project teams in oncology, inflammation, tissue repair, neurosciences, and metabolic diseases. Dr. Powell has extensive experience in data mining in support of projects across pharmaceutical discovery research. He was the Wyeth team leader that, in collaboration with Sertara, designed, developed, and deployed D360, the primary data mining tool for discovery research. He's an expert advisor and coordinator across therapeutic areas for kinase-based programs, including internal kinase panel selection, screening vendor selection, and kinase-focused library enhancement purchases. Dr. Powell obtained a BA in chemistry from the University of California at San Diego and a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Powell, welcome to today's webinar. I'll now pass the presentation over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Diana. Welcome, everybody, to the first in the Life Sciences Data Webinar Series. Today, we're going to be focused on the use of D360 to quickly access drug discovery project data, do some analysis on that data, record some decisions about that data, and then share with our collaborators. Now, my years at Wyeth and Pfizer managing projects as well as a consumer of data let alone talking to researchers across the industry, I found that quite often users were delayed in their access to data and therefore also delayed in their analysis of data. So quite frankly, that access could be delayed by the fact that they had to wait for an IT specialist to create or update a query, or for that matter, update a view when new data analysis or new data became available. Now, certainly in the spectrum of data retrieval to data analysis, you would prefer to spend most of your time on the data analysis side. And this has become even more difficult based upon the fact that there's a lot more data and a lot more complex data becoming available for researchers. So you're going to have pretty much everybody now has access to ADME data. There's also genomic data and proteomic data coming online, as well as a lot of high content data. So really, you have some very expensive data that's being generated. You need to make the decisions about that data as quickly as possible. And so for the fact of the matter, you should be spending most of your time analyzing the data and not retrieving it. That data comes in a lot of different places in organizations. So you may have compounds and batches in various silos. You may have in vitro results in another place. You may have project data. You may have assay data in another place. All this data together represents the kinds of things that you might see in the discovery effort as an organization. If you're lucky enough to have access to preclinical safety data, really what you want to do is see how that data is tied together with the discovery data. And that certainly was a goal at Wyeth. I wanted to understand the structure activity relationships for the safety studies not only for my compounds, but for also all the historical compounds as well. And for that matter, if you happen to be a safety assessor, you want to understand the cross-study analysis for all the safety data that you've generated. So quite frankly, these two data networks should be tied together pretty easily. And finally, of course, if you have access to clinical data, there is important historical as well as current clinical data that can feed back into discovery as well as into development. So all of this data network certainly should be able to be tied together, and D360 turns this kind of siloed approach at data 
into something that's a virtual data network that you can easily access. That allows you to pull all that data together, depending upon the kind of query that you want to generate, into a data set that you can examine across the entire spectrum of activity. So how does a user quest, uh, query this data network? So you might want to go ahead and query by a number of different levels. If you're early in discovery, you might want to look at compounds and their in vitro data. Of course, if you're a little later and you're looking at some in vivo analysis, you might want to look at salts, batches. And certainly, if you're in the safety area, you might want to look at it at the safety study level or the animal level, and of course, onwards down to clinical trials. So D360 allows you to go ahead and pick the level of the study, the level of the information you want, with the data all connected in a logical sense to allow you to pull it all back together into the same data set. Once you pick your category, then you can immediately go in and, and easily create a, create a query. All users can create queries in D360. This is not designed to be an expert tool, though certainly you can get a great deal of expert data out of the data set. Once you've created the query, then you can go directly into a data set where you can start doing your analysis. Now, I mentioned that all users can access uh, queries and create them. So, of course, you're going to see some users that are more early adopters or faster adopters, and you want to benefit from their experience in creating queries. And so you can go ahead, they can go ahead and turn those queries into something that are called quick search widgets, which we'll be discussing shortly, to allow and share that out to the rest of the project team so they can go directly into the data that they're interested in. This means that not only can all users and all members of your team both create queries, but they can all benefit from those queries as well as data set and analysis tools that other users have prepared. This means that everybody can be involved in the analysis process. Now, what D360 certainly does in the background is to make sure that all those various data sources are easily put together in a logical sense so that you can find the assays and the entities that you're most interested in without having to find out where the data resides. Now, we're going to be talking about a project data set, and we're going to be focusing on taking that data set, doing some analysis, making some decisions about that, uh, those compounds in that data set, and then sending that on, uh, uh, recording those comments for other people to use within the project team. So now I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, the live application. And when we start out in D360, you're presented with a project um, uh, dashboard. What I would ordinarily do when I came in here is, first of all, look at my Thomson Reuters investigational drug widgets and see what the latest drug news is for things from discovery in the last seven days. And I can see a couple of things that I might be interested in following up here, so I will probably come back later after the session and look at the drug news from AbV, as well as some of this HDAC information from Cancera AB. The next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and take a quick look at my favorite compound that I've left in the Quick Viewer details. This gives me a view of both the structure as well as the most recent assay that it was run in as well as some of the results. So I can see that most recently it was run in C-ABLE with an IC50 of 1.2 nanomolar. I can see a number of targets that it's been in as well as a number of assays that it's been in. And in fact, the fact that it's been in 14 assays reminds me that there's probably a few more assays that's been tested in that I don't have included in my project query that we're going to examine in a little bit. So I'll probably come back in the middle of my data set and add some additional assays to see if I can capture uh, what other additional information is known about this compound. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick look at my notification widget. And this will tell me about recent schedule queries that I have run, and in particular, schedule queries that I have run. That will tell me if there's any new data in the queries that I have set up. I'm going to focus most of my attention on this kinase project query. This is um, actually stored in the oncology shared workspace area so that all the members of the project team have access to this. 
And I've actually flagged the, the ID field, the structure constraint, and my primary asset here. So I've set this up. I'm, I've gone ahead and set this up so that I'm going to bring back pretty much all the results from the assay because uh, certainly we're not at the uh, less than 100 picomolar level yet. So I'm going to go directly off the data set. Once again, I'm going to bring back all the compounds and do some analysis on the compounds. Now, I have this set to be aggregated at the structure level, and I can see um, I have this geometric mean uh, set up for CSARC. I remember that there was this new assay result for c -able. I'm going to go ahead and drill down to it, and I can see this 1.2 nanomolar, and here's the IC50 curve. Looks like I only have one result for this compound. I have, some I have a couple of calculated properties here, and it looks like for this collection of compounds, and for the most part, the molecular weight is pretty much in line is exactly where I want it to be. And the log P seems to be pretty much in the, in the range of what I'm interested in. Here's a sanitation column where, I've, where we tracked at the project team meeting earlier this week some comments about some of the compounds. I'm going to come back and refer to this a little bit later. Now, the goal for this particular set of compounds was to find compounds with good CSARC activity. And I wanted to minimize the EGFR activity, and then I'm going to look for some of the selectivity profile across the rest of these kinases. So in order to track the EGFR selectivity, I'm going to look at this equation column I have set up here. I'm going to go ahead and minimize the rows, or collapse the rows, so I can look at this in a little bit more detail. And I can see, since this is pre-sorted by CSARC, that I have compounds with pretty good potency for CSARC and a number of them with good selectivity for EGFR. Let's just uh, go ahead and take a quick look at sorted by the EGFR CSARC selectivity. And a compounds with very good selectivity, maybe a little less potency uh, for CSARC than I would like. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and filter these compounds to meet kind of the primary goal parameters for this data. So let's go ahead and grab EGFR selectivity of greater than 100. And let's go ahead and grab CSART of less than 10 nanomolar. So I'm going to go ahead and filter these. So I have nine compounds here that have good CSARC activity, good selectivity, so that meets my initial goal for the compounds. And I can see that a number of these I tracked with respect to EGFR selectivity. And also it looks like peak I3K delta activity um, during the last project team meeting. I'm going to take a quick glance at some of these other kinases. And certainly EGFR, or excuse me, VEGFR, is a kinase I would love to have activity against because it would be nice to go ahead and inhibit angiogenesis at the same time while I'm developing an anti-cancer compound. So I have a couple of compounds with pretty good potency, 4.3 and 10 nanomolar. I think I'm going to go ahead and add a comment that I want to go ahead and uh, remember about this. This is CSARC, VEGFR, as well as EGFR selective. Now I'm going to go ahead, and go ahead and take a look at the selected fragments here. So I'm going to remind myself about what I did for this series column. So let's see. I've gone ahead and tagged these various fragments. The parahalo has all the halos, and of course the metahydroxy in bowls and the aromatic. So it looks like for this collection of compounds where they have good c stark activity, good selected for EGFR, and a couple of these with VEGF activity that primarily they have these parahalo fragments as well as some metahydroxy. I can see that represented down here in the histogram as well. I'm going to look at the entire collection of compounds and see what else I can find. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the filters. 
So as I mentioned earlier, I was interested in adding some VEGF activity, and as part of this query, I've included this scatter graph of a log log CSARC versus VEGFR, and I've included a color code um, from the EGFR CSARC selectivity, so I can see these compounds, these compounds in the bottom left-hand corner have pretty good selectivity as well as relatively good potency for VEGF as well. And once again, I can see they're in a parahalo set of compounds. And looking over at my grid display, I can see that I've included uh, most of the fields that I would want to keep track of for color coding, and look pretty, for the most part, they look pretty green to me, so that's a good sign. So I want to explore some of the rest of these kinase selectivities. And I can certainly plot them all like this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and do an analysis all at once. I'm going to grab the correlation matrix. And I'm going to go ahead and add all the fields to the correlation matrix and go ahead and compute it. And now I can see, I'm going to go ahead and expand this out a little bit. And now I can see CSART, um, by way of reference, the darker the red and the bigger the number, the higher the correlation. I can see a little bit of correlation with EGFR as uh, we're trying to avoid. Not surprising, a uh, relatively good correlation with C-ABLE. So quite often compounds that are CSARC and the CSARC family uh, inhibitors also have good C-ABLE activity. And here's this PI3K delta activity looks pretty high. Certainly not as high a relationship as the other lipid kinases together, but certainly might be problematic. So let's take a look at the PI3K delta activity versus CSAR. Let's move this over here. Let me turn this into a log log plot. So I'm going to select log log. So certainly these are compounds with poor PI3K delta activity. Um, and here's where they appear in my kind of desired profile. At the same time, these compounds here looks like they have some PI3K delta activity. But it looks like I can probably avoid it um, by focusing a little bit more in this region. Let me select that again. And even though these compounds have good PI3K delta activity, I still have a number of compounds here that are selective. And selectivity, of course, is um, a relative thing. It's 100 nanomolar against PI3K delta compared to 120 picomolar against CSARC is not terribly worrisome. So I've already captured that in the project team meeting, a couple of comments about that. This is selective. This is also selective. And I probably can capture additional compounds as well. So not only is this EGFR selective, but probably I should go ahead and put in a comment about PD, excuse me, PI3K delta selective. And I've gone ahead and set this to submit for the queue um, for broader panel screening uh, against kinases, and that's a good thing. And ordinarily, uh, at a pharmaceutical company, I would probably have a link directly out to the ordering application. But for this demo, for this application, I'm just going to go ahead and note the fact that I want to go ahead and submit it for testing. Now let's take a little closer look at this PI3K delta stuff. So. I obviously have compounds here with poor or relatively poor CSARC activity, but good PI3K delta activity. Let's go ahead and move these guys to the top. Let's take a quick look at these guys. So clearly there's a compound here with pretty much great selectivity for PI3K delta over everything. So I'm going to go ahead and keep track of this. And 
And I think I'll probably send some information on to the lipid kinase group to remind them that in my collection of compounds, there's a compound that's pretty selective for PI3K delta. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize this one to give me a little bit more space. And instead of focusing on selected pieces of the data, I'm going to try to look at the more global set of characteristics structure-wise. I picked the tripos atom pairs as a structure descriptor for the clustering, but you can also pick unity fingerprints. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this, and I can see that I have a couple of clusters of molecules. Let me go ahead and apply a little bit of coloring to this. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the color from the CSARC assay. I'm going to turn the transparency down so that I can, so it'll show a little bit better. And I can see I have a cluster of molecules down here with pretty good activity. And another hidden in this cluster of compounds. These guys up on the outer edge appear to be probably reference compounds. Yeah, those look like reference compounds. I think I'm going to take a little closer look at some of these. I'm going to turn on a primary viewer mode and then grab these compounds down here. I can see pretty good selectivity. CSARC, as well as uh, against HCK, as well as some of the selected fragments. And I can see my profile over here in the grid display looks pretty good. But these are primarily parahalo as well as metahydroxy. Let's take a look at this other cluster here. So these would be, appear to be mostly azindoles as well as other Asia and Doles, and certainly a couple of them meet the characteristics I'm interested in, so I need to pay a little bit closer attention to these guys as we go forward. But quite frankly, when I look at my CSARC versus VEGF graph, modest selectivity and relatively modest potency. I'm going to go ahead and take that out of primary viewer mode. Uh, one of the things I forgot to do earlier when I was looking at the ones that met the initial criteria was to go ahead and mark some of those records. So I'm going to go ahead and refilter those to find those guys. Because I want to pay attention to those as I go along. So I'm going to go ahead and select these guys and go ahead and mark all of them. So as I go through the data set, I can keep track of them. Now let's go ahead and remove the filter again so I can see all of the data. Now in addition to looking at the overall set of um, structural characteristics to cluster compounds, I think I'm going to dig into look at some of the R group analysis to see if I can figure out if any of the fragments are particularly important to activity, aside from the ones that I recorded in these special fragments with the chemical series column. So I'm going to go ahead, going to go ahead and minimize this for a second to give me a little more real estate. And I'm going to go ahead and, and do an R-group analysis. So, so I'm just going to go ahead and edit the structure and put in some R groups. R1 and R2. Transfer back. And I'm going to go ahead and see how many of the compounds in this data set fit that core. And I have 167. I suspect these other four are actually the reference compounds for the assay. Let's go ahead and add this to the data set. I'm 
Let's go ahead and take a look at these guys. So pretty much what I would expect, especially for my top compounds. But the first thing I'm going to want to do is do an R group matrix, R1 versus R2. Now this will let me dig into the fragments that are important for activity. So I can see the fragments for R1 and the fragments for R2. Uh, let me decrease the size here a little bit so I can see more of the matrix. And it's pretty clear we made a lot of isopropyls at R2, and we've made a lot of methyl hydroxy as well as some of these halos in the R1 position. So clearly, there's a lot of room to fill out this matrix. But let's go ahead and add some value or some color value directly here. And I'm going to go ahead and grab the C-Sark assay again. I think I'm going to go ahead and set the size for the selectivity as well. So now I can see pretty much here's where a lot of my activity is. Once again, the isopropyl versus a couple of the groups that we prepared, uh, that we looked at earlier, the, the hydroxy phenyl as well as the halo phenyl, a lot of cyclo, uh, cyclopentyls as well as some pentahydrofurans. Most of the activity is centered in these small groups, plus there's some additional R groups over here where there's some additional activity. And you might want to follow up on some of these other compounds later. Let's look across here a little bit. I can see that most of the other groups, based upon the profile that I'm interested in, aren't showing the activity that I'm interested in. So pretty much down in this region. Let's go ahead and tile all these viewers again. And now I'm going to go ahead and try to focus and see what the fragments are for the most interesting compounds. So let's go ahead and sort by the marked compounds that I had found earlier. Actually, let's sort the other direction. the marked compounds to the top. Now I'm going to go ahead um, and turn this spreadsheet into a primary viewer again. So now I can just look at these guys and I can see in my R group matrix the fragments that are responsible for its activity. So once again, the hydroxyfluoro, the coral hydroxy, so this is a matrix of my most important compounds that meet most of the criteria I'm interested in. But clearly, there are some holes here in this matrix. And probably one of the things that I'll recommend to the team is that we fill in the rest of this matrix to see if there's some additional selectivity as well as activity that we might be interested in. So let's go ahead and turn off the primary viewer for a moment, come back to the rest of the data. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this viewer as well. All these viewers are still available. They're down in the bottom corner. But now, um, as I mentioned earlier on when I was first looking at the dashboard, I saw that there were a couple of assays uh, that were recorded for my favorite compound. I can believe that's this compound over here. Let's find my favorite. This is the one that's 0.12. I'll go ahead and copy that to the clipboard. But there was some additional data here that I didn't get recorded in these eight or so kinases I have here. So an easy thing to do is to go back and uh, add things to the query directly or recreate the query. Probably an easier thing to do is, since I'm already in the data set, I'm already in the middle of my analysis, is I'm going to go ahead and add in some data directly. So I'm going to go to Add Data. And I'm going to see the data catalog here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and um, I think there's an additional calculator property that I should probably add. PSA, maybe that'll give me a little bit better idea about how likely these are to be orally active. 
I already have two annotation columns from the Oncology Project. Is there another one? Uh, there's the paper comments, but I don't think I'm going to add that now. Um, and in the results, now the Kemble results are organized by mechanism of action. So all the kinase data is, is under kinases, excuse me, all the kinase data is under enzymes. And quite frankly, at the vast majority of the places where D360 is deployed, the data will be organized by probably therapeutic area, followed by project team, followed by a number of different organizations that make sense. But for this data, what makes the most sense is to organize by mechanism of action followed by kinase. Now, I can start picking a number of these, but probably the easier thing to do is to filter the whole data catalog by the compound that I'm interested in. So I'm going to open up the filter dialog and go ahead and paste in that Kimball ID. And now I'm going to filter the data set, excuse me, the data catalog by all the assays that that compound tested in. And I could have put in a list of compounds to find all the assays, but I just picked that one. So most of these seem to be ones that I already have in the data set. But I would like to add this mTOR one. That's certainly a, an assay and a project team that's of current interest here at the group. And while I'm here, I think I'm going to go ahead and grab some safety data. So I'm going to, instead of adding all the safety data, I think I'm just going to go ahead and grab the study title. That'll let me know that there's some safety data available for some of these compounds, if there are any. And I can follow up later within a more extensive query. So let's go ahead and add this to the data set. And I think um, it's giving me the option here. I think I'm going to go ahead and add that directly to my grid display. And then let's come over to where the rest of this data is. Let's hide some of these columns and give us a little more space. Now, I can see for PSA that most of these compounds uh, in this list are kind of in the moderate range for PSA, um, a couple not so great. It's actually interesting that Jefinibit, I can always have problems pronouncing that, is actually relatively good for PSA. And Desatinib, both of these are marketed compounds, is really, really poor. But I'm not going to be too worried about the PSA for my top compounds. Let's grab this mTOR data and drag it over next to the rest of the data. Now, for my top compounds, most of them don't have very good mTOR activity. But certainly, it looks like there's a couple of compounds down here that do have good mTOR activity. So let's go ahead and sort um, by the mTOR activity to see what's interesting here. So here we have a great compound with pretty good mTOR activity, but not so great CSARC activity. But here's a compound with pretty good mTOR activity, good selectivity, and relatively good CSARC. So we'll call this, let's keep track of this one, mTOR and CSARC and EGFR. It also looks, I'm going to come back to this compound here. It looks like this compound is actually pretty selective for mTOR across most all the assays, except for perhaps PI3K delta, but still, this is a compound that is good mTOR activity, and maybe I need to go ahead and remind the mTOR group that I have a compound in my collection of compounds that I'm interested in that has good mTOR activity. And you know, this compound should probably be submitted for testing. Now, I did add that safety data over here, and it appears that amongst my top compounds, let me go ahead and resort for those guys.
that I have a couple of compounds with at least 14 or 15 day rest study. So these are compounds I'm going to have to follow up with with additional safety uh, analysis. And certainly the use of safety data within T360, both in this kind of a data set as well as from the beginning, as well as looking at the more detail about the safety studies, will be part of future webinar that you're going to see in uh, another couple of months. So now I've got all the data collected. Uh, I've added some analysis pieces. I've added some comments. And I want to be able to share this out to the rest of the members of the project team. So I'm going to go ahead and save the data set query. And I'm going to go ahead and save it to the Oncology Project Workspace. And I'll go ahead and call this a new project query. I can see that it's saved as a widget, so I'm going to go ahead and save that out. And now I'm going to come back over to the dashboard. Here's my new query, and every member of the project team can take, can take a look at this. Uh, actually, uh, and they'll see this the next time they log into the T360, but I think I really want them to know about it right now. So I'm going to go ahead, find that query, and I'm going to go ahead and email a link to it directly. So I'll save that out to my good friend Dave Wallace. And he'll be able to go ahead and take a look at it uh, directly by clicking on the link and running it. So Dave will be able to come to, same, to the same brilliant point of view that I have for this collection of compounds. So let me come back to the presentation. And let me go ahead and proceed back to that last slide. So I want to remind you about a couple of things that we did during this session. First of all, directly from a widget that was created by a project team member in a couple of minutes and shared out to the rest of the project team, we were able to get direct access to all the data that I was interested in from my project team. I was able to do some integrated analysis directly within there and actually record some of the comments into the annotation fields for sharing with other project team members both in that query as well as any other query that was generated. We're also able to go ahead and explore some additional data, including the safety data, the mTOR data, as well as some additional calculated properties without leaving the data set by merely adding the data directly to the data set. So that means I didn't have to lose my train of thought. And then finally, the updated query we were able to share out to a workspace that everybody can access. And then I went ahead and alerted one of my project team members that there was a new query available and that they should go ahead and take a look at it. So the efforts that I captured during my analysis, everybody else can share and look at at the same time. And at the end of the day, I spent, as well as you would spend, a lot less time finding out how to collect the data but more of the time spent directly in the data analysis. The other nice thing about this is that it has a very low IT footprint. I didn't spend any time requiring an IT specialist to build or change the query. New assays show up automatically in the data catalog for me to be able to find and add to my data. And in fact, that was the new data that showed up on the dashboard when I was looking at one of my favorite compounds. Now, as I mentioned during the during the live demonstration, there's going to be another webinar coming up relatively soon where we're going to look a lot more closely at preclinical safety data, how to put it together, how to integrate it with the regular data sets that you have. Following that, there'll be some webinars on the cost of not changing your informatics system, as well as some tailor-made informatics from an off-the-shelf product. So that concludes the 
live portion of the webinar, and we'll go to questions and answers now. Well, thank you, Dennis. And ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the Q&A panel lower right. Please be sure to direct your question to the default setting, which is all panelists. Also, please note that your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. I'd now like to turn the call back over to Diana. Thanks, Nathan. Dennis, the first question is this. You showed adding data into the view you were looking at, but who created that first project search that you looked at? So actually, I created that um, and saved that out just like I saved it out the, the final version of the data of the query. So I created it, saved it to the Oncology Project Workspace, and then it was accessible by me as well as everybody in that team. Can I get a form view of data or just a spreadsheet? Certainly. Um, a form view is a great way to consolidate all the information into one page. So certainly if you want to look at a profile of, compound, profile of your compounds where you may have 10, 20, 30, I don't know, maybe 100 different fields, it's much easier to consolidate it in a form. So you can start in D360 with a form, or you can add a form to your spreadsheet data set as well to look at the consolidated data in your form. The other nice thing you can do in a form is look at details directly in tables on the form at the same time. Okay, great. Uh, the next question then is, how do you calculate the mean for the biological data? Often there are greater than or less than values? So um, all the calculations um, for, the, for this particular data set are done on the fly by aggregation business rules. And those business rules will vary from company to company. But quite often, as you noted, there are a lot of out-of-range data, less than 5 or greater than 10, and you need to have good business rules to decide how to aggregate that data together. So D360 can aggregate on the fly. You can pick not only the mean or the geometric mean or median or whatever you like, but this allows you to apply those business rules to all that data to get something out logically that you would expect to see for that aggregated value. Now, that, as I said, that varies from company to company, and you can pick the business rules that you like. Okay, great. Next question. Can D360 be linked to read the data and structures from the Oracle database directly? Could you repeat that question, Diana? I can. Um, can D360 be linked to read data and structures from the Oracle database directly? Yeah, so um, the, the view of the data that you just looked at, now, looked at during the live session was linked directly to the Oracle database for the Kemble data that we had. And so D360 allows you to look at a number of different data storage systems, including Oracle, as well as you can import data from web services as well as other internal data sources within the uh, within whatever organization you belong to. So it's going to bring in the structures, all the biological data, all the calculated properties. Um, there's also ways to link document retrieval information directly within the data set. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Um, next question. Does D360 search a special database or warehouse that needs to be built for the application? And does data need to be summarized for that database? So the nice thing about D360 is it doesn't really care whether you have a warehouse, a set of federated data sources, or a combination of the both. It does not require you to pour your data into any one thing. It actually creates a virtual view of all of that data together. So. Your IT people don't have to change the way they're organizing or collecting their data. D360 will actually connect to all of it. And what was the second half of your question? Does data need, to be, sum does data need to be summarized for that database was the second half? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. So data doesn't have to be pre-summarized or pre-aggregated. Uh, D360 is agnostic with regards to that. Certainly, if you have the data unsummarized, we can apply all of the summarization capabilities we have on the fly. At the same time, we can present your pre-aggregated data at the same time. One of the things we haven't covered here today, but we can certainly discuss at a later webinar, 
just how you can do dynamic pivoting within D360 to get all of the data out that you're interested in. So D360, in summary, D360 allows you to, ag to access all that unaggregated or pre-aggregated data as well as unpivoted or pre-pivoted data. It really doesn't particularly care. Okay, next question. Is there a way to track the compound's progression through multiple assays and tiers and also submit a selected list of compounds for a specific new assay? So sure, you, um, there are, you can certainly set up equation columns to track uh, all of your criteria for what you think should go into an annotation column. So you can certainly use a number of ways to both track priority for, or voting, shall we say, for how, how uh, compounds are behaving at each one of your desired assays, roll all those kinds of um, summary comments up into an equation, and actually keep track of how your compounds are profiled across all the assays. And then what you would do is utilize a follow-on action directly within the D360 data set to push those compounds that you selected off to an ordering system. And that's quite, quite common to use at a number of uh, organizations. Okay, um, the next question is, who sets up the project searches and how quickly can new assays be added to the reports? So, um, certainly in most organizations, we find a whole collection of users setting up project searches. Um, I would think that you would find that most organizations there are people that are, are a lot more adept at, at deciding what data belongs together in a project search, but anybody can do that. Um, and quite often I see uh, one or two or three or four people uh, in a larger group will actually create queries, share them out to the rest of the project team. So anybody can do it, but certainly you quite often find one or two people doing that. Um, with respect to adding new data to the project query, so it certainly depends upon how you want to manage that. The way that uh, I did it here by taking my initial project query, adding additional data fields to it, and then sharing that to the workspace is one route. Uh, you can certainly make one person responsible for updating new, uh, new fields to the, to the project query that if you're interested in sharing that. Or for that matter, you can keep a copy in your own area and add things to it that you might want to keep track of that you think is important. With respect to new data, obviously new data as it's entered into Oracle automatically appears directly in the data set when you run the query. And with respect to new fields, but certainly those are added automatically into the D360 data catalog and always available to use. So it's pretty easy to find the new data, find the new data fields, as well as update them and share them out to the rest of your project team. Okay, Dennis, uh, this question is, where is this information stored? Is there a database for the application? And what happens if the data D360 is connecting to changes? So um, a couple of thoughts here. So the, the annotation uh, stuff as well as a number of the artifacts from D360 like queries, um, lists, data sets, and so on is all stored in an Oracle schema uh, for D360. That's not something that's recorded directly in uh, the source data systems for your data. However, since D360 is able to tie all that together, it appears seamlessly directly in the data catalog. And the second half of your question, Diana? Sorry, Dennis. Um, it, it was um, what happens if the data D360 is connecting to changes. So, um, so first of all, uh, a couple of ways that data can change. First of all, new data can be put in, um, or data can be changed uh, at the record level. That data is always going to be evidenced when you run your query. New data fields get automatically added um, within an hour or two uh, as soon as a, a metadata refresh happens. So if your biologist adds a new field or adds a new assay, shall we say, that data is available automatically in the data catalog. 
Uh, if you have new comments that you've added to the T360 side of it, that automatically appears in the data catalog and is available for people to use. So if, the data if you decide that you need to add a new data source to T360, that's certainly something with a small amount of configuration change can be added directly, and that will appear immediately in the data catalog for everybody to use. Okay, um, next question. How would you say D360 compares to Spotfire? Well, Spotfire is a, it's a very good and uh, powerful analysis tool. Um, for the most part, it doesn't have a great deal of chemical intelligence besides what you might um, self-build or drag in. In addition, Spotfire is much harder to find all the data that you're interested in as well as collect it all. So quite frankly, you have to know a lot about the underlying data structure in order to be able to create the data queries that feed data into Spotfire. So great analysis tool, very powerful. However, pretty difficult to grab all the data that you want to see, including, quite frankly, all the data across the entire discipline from discovery on through to development. Now, the, one of the things that I did not demonstrate during D360 is that actually uh, D360 has a live two-way integration with Spotfire. So that if you find that you have additional analysis that you don't want to do uh, in D360, you can actually push the button and that data shows up in Spotfire and you have a live two-way link between D360 and Spotfire. So Spotfire serves as an external viewer for D360. But once again, Spotfire, great analysis tool. At the same time, pretty difficult to bring your data in unless you're an IT professional to start doing your analysis, as well as the fact that it doesn't have some of the chemical analysis tools that we have in D360. Okay, thanks. Now, we have time for just one more question. So, uh, Dennis, the question is this. What kinds of data formats can be searched? Databases, web services, what? Um, all of those. So we have access to lots of different databases, uh, database technology, Oracle, MySQL, you name it. We, uh, we utilize quite a number of chemical cartridges, practically everything in the industry. In fact, I think everything in the industry. Uh, certainly within the data set itself, you can get additional data uh, directly and bring in a lot of data from internal web services. Uh, so it's possible to have runtime engines sitting out there to calculate model information and bring that data in, as well as run calculated properties directly. Of course, a number of those things that you may set up as calculated properties directly will show up in the data catalog, but there's a lot of abilities to build in additional data input directly into D360. At the same time, there's a software development kit that allows you to bring in specialized viewers as well as specialized information from your corporation or organization directly into the data set. Dennis, thank you very much. This does conclude today's question and answer session. I want to remind everyone that a link to a replay of this webinar will be available on the Sotara website within the next few days and that we will be sending an email to you with a link as well so that you can replay or forward to a friend. The current slide provides information on who you may contact with questions you have regarding Sotara's products and services in the Americas and Europe, as well as Dr. Powell's contact information should you wish more information on today's presentation. On behalf of Sotara, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. This concludes today's webinar, and you may now disconnect.